Please stand and we will sing hymn 544. text begins on page 123, beginning with the Trinitarian acclamation. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Together, Almighty God, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Amos, chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations, to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalna and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, and go down to Gath, to the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
A reading from 1 Timothy, chapter 6, beginning at the 11th verse. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who, re who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that they may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that they should, if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today we cover the second commandment in our sermon series on the Ten Commandments. You shall remember the first one last week, you shall have no other gods before me. It was about who we worship. I mean, everybody's going to worship something, right? We're going to really think that something is the very best that demands all of my life and all of my attention. Maybe it's a music star, a movie star, politician, or the true and living God. So it's about who we worship, that everything we say and do is for this God's glory. Today, it's about how we worship. So the second commandment is about that, and I'll read it. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn to Exodus 20, beginning in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. This command, commandment is about God giving us directions about worshiping the right way. It breaks down into several clauses. The first clause, no making idols. Don't manufacture things to worship. And then second one, then don't worship them, obviously. Why? Because God says that he's jealous, and we'll unpack that in a minute. And then those who worship wrongly reveal that they actually hate God. And they bring curses on themselves because of it. And the last clause, those who are faithful, who worship God rightly, will receive blessings that just ricochet down through the generations. Look at clause one, do not make an idol. Hebrew word means a carved image. Understand that, that this is the law given on Mount Sinai. The Hebrew children have just come out of Egypt. God told Moses, Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. A lot of turmoil there. They finally got out of town. And and understand that every nation in the world, all around them, everybody worshiped idols. Where's Britt Lowry? He's around here somewhere, right? Britt? He was out in the lobby. Anyway, he goes to India a lot. And so they have these big festivals where they take a big idol and, and put it on this big platform and people carry it and set it on fire and then throw, put it out into a lake. And the, the newspaper articles just report, you know, this is how we worship our idol. And so this is not something that's uh, gone away. Every nation in the ancient world had idols except for this one group called the Jews, the Hebrews. Now, it was understood that the carved image itself was not the God. It represented some invisible God somewhere, but there were a whole bunch of them, and it got really confusing real quick, which God he's supposed to worship. I mean, if the God of the tree is in conflict with the God of the shrub, or if the God of the stream uh, pours water into the God of the lake, which God is greater than that. I mean, you can just go crazy trying to figure all that out. But the, the cool thing about idols in the mind of those idolaters was, I own this thing. And this God is obligated to do what I want it to do as long as I say the right things and as long as I give it some food. That's the one thing the idol couldn't do is feed itself. It does, and this goes on to this day. In Hinduism and all kind of other places, people put food in front of the idols and then pick it up in the next morning and they never have figured it out that this stone or wood thing didn't eat a bite of it. And I was just thinking, you know, after a while you're going to figure out, is this really making any kind of sense at all? So the Lord God... He gives a command, but it's not saying rah, 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 rah. It's the love for his people. He decreed that this ridiculous practice should never be done. Why? Because Yahweh, the God who identified himself by name at the burning bush, I am who I am, he's really the only God. The universe is not run by a committee. 
One God has one law for everything, completely transcendent, never needing to be fed, beholden to no one. Yahweh is the creator of the universe, the covenant maker who lives in a love relationship with those he loves. He's the one and he's the only. And then he says he's jealous. Well, that sounds like a bad thing. That's usually not seen as a positive thing. Jealousy in the extreme sometimes can be a sign of insecurity or even of a mental disorder. But I would hold up to you that jealousy can be a positive thing. If I saw someone coming up to my wife and start to hug on her and kiss her, I would be jealous. And if she saw the same thing happening with me, she would be jealous. Why? Because there is something special in our marital bond. I have coveted my life to be with her and she with me. We say, divorce never, murder maybe. <laughs> well, she's Scottish. So I, I treat her really well. But that jealousy, that feeling of, look, I've got something special here, something wonderful here, is something that's precious. And anything that comes in between us and her, me and her is somebody up to no good. They're trying to do evil. That's my wife. That's my girlfriend. You don't mess with her. That's the same thing with God. We're his children. He loves us. He created us. He provides everything for us. I don't grow the food I eat. I mean, I got a few peppers and a few tomatoes, yeah, but, but on the whole, no. But he gives us all of this thing from this beautiful planet Earth. He's given us his son, Jesus Christ. Not yet in Genesis, I real, uh, in Exodus, I realize, but that's coming. But jealousy keeps that relationship intact the way jealousy would keep a marital bond intact. God is that way. He's totally devoted to us. We are to worship him back with the same undivided devotion that, that he gives us. We are never to use anything as an object of worship in place of him. Which brings up a controversial issue. You can go crazy going online trying to figure out what idolatry really is. There's one side of the spectrum that says, if you have a picture of Jesus in your church, a stained glass window, or if you have, even have a cross, you're into idolatry. Other folks have statues in their church, and they put, like the Blessed Virgin Mary, and they put flowers around it, and they go kiss the statue or icons, and they kiss the icons, and that seemed to be okay. Uh, they say, though, there's a difference between venerating things and worshiping things. And as I've studied it this week, for the life of me, I can't figure out the difference. Here's what I believe is right. And I'm willing to have conversations and be corrected if I'm wrong. But drawn from the rest of this commandment, where it's all about loves and hates, the worship is really about your heart. Okay? Visual images are not evil in and of themselves. Now, we always want to compare Scripture to Scripture, right? That's what good Protestants do. I mean, we look Catholic, but we're really Protestant. So uh, we compare Scripture with Scripture. So are there any visual representations of the created order or angelic beings even in Scripture? And the answer is, well, actually, yes. The Ark of the Covenant was topped with two cherubim facing each other. These are creatures with a lion's body, an eagle's wings, and a man's head. They're facing each other, and they spread out their wings, one facing each other, and it kind of made, you know, the heads and then the arms kind of made a seat. That's called the mercy seat, where the invisible God would come and sit. The priest's vestment, the hem of it was lined with gold pomegranates that had a little clapper in them, made a little bell so you could hear him moving around. The lampstand in the holy place had the stems and calyxes, that's that little thing, the sepals, of the flowers of plants. 
And then when you get to Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 7, it had a ton of them. Uh, plants and oxen and lions, more cherubim and even palm trees. So here's what I and I think most Christians believe. It's really about the heart worship. If your heart hates God and believes that material things can bring you great happiness and is really material things are, wor are worthy of your most ultimate worship and that these things can do something spiritual for you, you've crossed a line. A material thing can be a carved idol or any other thing that supplants God. If you see a picture of Jesus or a statue or a cross and it reminds you, reminds you of God and his love, that's well and good. Your heart is still completely fixed on Almighty God, okay? But if you, and, and here's the thing. I'm one of these sort of high church folks that bows to the cross when it passes by and we reverence the altar when we come in. It's not that this table's any going to give me anything. The altar represents the, the body of Christ who is the altar where the sacrifice was made. I'm willing actually to reconsider that, but that may be a step too far. I'm going to have to figure that out and since we're in community, y'all help me out with that one. But if you ascribe any power to, okay, I'm going to bow to this cross and God's going to do me a little favor. I'm going to bow to the altar or I'm going to bow to the icon or put wreaths around the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you think that gets you points with God, then you've crossed a line. It's just a statue. It's just a picture. God is God and those things are not. If your car or your house or a Hollywood star or the American Idol, I mean, that's kind of blatant, or anything else in this world becomes to you a source of identity or loyalty or protection or direction in life or love or joy or any other reason that you might have that draws you away from the worshiping God, I say to you in love and in all seriousness, repent. Repent from that. Reorient your life to God who really is God. Don't get sucked into worshiping things that really aren't God because the devil will use that. First of all, he will make you a fool and then he will destroy you. Acts 17, famous chapter Paul is in Athens, right? And so he's, he's in this pagan place. There's no church there. He's just there kind of all by himself. Now, when Paul was in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. These are Gentiles who've come to worship in the Jewish way. And in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was always preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, uh, that's uh, the, the Mount of Ares, the war god, the, also known as Mars, Mars Hill, saying, may... May we know about this new teaching that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. The Greek word could be religious positive or eh, not so good. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, 
as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. The times, in the times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man who he has appointed, that would be Jesus, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Is there anything greater than we can worship other than the God of this universe? If we do, we must repent. Going from folly to wisdom, from falsehood to truth, from darkness into light, even from death into life. In John's gospel, Jesus comes across a woman at the well, famous, uh, the fourth chapter of John, famous passage there. He comes into town, it's noonday, his disciples have gone away for a little bit, and so he's stuck there at the well all by himself. And then there's this woman of Samaria who comes by, and so now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. A woman from Samaria came to the well in Sychar, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. So two counts against her. To a Jew, Samaritans are people you spit at when you walk by them. And a woman, a man just doesn't talk to a woman in a public place in this culture. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, John adds parenthetically. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's talking to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, I have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have is not your husband. You have, what you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus is directing us to where our worship really ought to go and how that worship ought to be in spirit and in truth. Worship is not about gathering together and hearing a lecture and singing a couple of songs and going home. True worship is our hearts, the human spirit, being engaged with the Holy Spirit of God and having sweet communion. Worship is real worship when it's infused with the presence of God. We experience the fruit of the Spirit, I believe, beginning in worship itself. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, and self-control. All of these things start in worship when we realize that God is the sovereign God, that he's worthy of our praise, and that if we open up our hearts and yield to him, 
the commandment not to worship other gods is not because God's being mean and nasty. He wants us to come into the fullness of joy that he has for us. And that's what happens in worship. The word, it's breathed out by the Holy Spirit. The sacrament, this is my body, this is my blood, Jesus says. There's a, a spiritual reality that takes place in there. It's mysterious, but it's true. We're also to worship in truth, in God's word. That's the scriptures. Knowing the truth about God leads to worshiping God rightly. If we know that God is, is his power, his beauty, his holiness, his will, his plan, his justice, his love, his grace upon grace upon grace, his sending his son Jesus to be our Savior and Lord, all this comes from knowing God and the Word. So the question for us, beloved, is will we worship him rightly? Is this a matter that we take seriously? Will we worship with all of our devotion in a way God wants us to do it? Remember that positive and ne negative aspect I alluded to uh, last week about the Ten Commandments, that everything we're supposed to renounce opens us up in even to greater vistas of joy and purpose and fulfillment. Renouncing all of our idols gives us the joy of stepping out of folly and bondage into the light of God. John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol-making factory. This commandment is given to keep us from stepping into that factory. If we move into the light of God, we move into eternal security of a loving God who claims us as his own, who's jealous for us because he loves us, into soul-changing love and worship that really matters, worship of the one who's worthy of all of our praise. Paul says it really well in this epistle lesson. We worship the one who is this, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And turning to page 127, let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For fully our Archbishop, 
and Stephen, our bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy. For Duncan, called to be our associate to the rector, that his immigration process would be speedily accomplished. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joseph, our president, Roy, our governor, the legislatures and courts, and those in the armed services. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you our dear brother in Christ, Frank Kirk, who suffered a severe stroke last night. We pray that you would be with Frank, be with his wife, Lindy, during this time. May your grace, your mercy, and your love flow down upon them both. Also, Lord, please be with the doctors and all those who will care for Frank over these coming days. Give them the wisdom and the skill that comes only from you. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of their resurrection. In thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father. Grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised the forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Please stand. Beloved in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, brother.
You may be seated. Jen, go ahead and make your way on up here, girl. Let me get a few little announcements out of the way. Today we're having vestry elections. For, uh, it's uh, open for folks who are church members, so uh, there's a description of who a church member is that on the table there. You can vote right after this service if you want to. This it's outside. Okay. Okay. All right. It's outside. Friday afternoon, uh, by the grace of God and the people consenting, the bishop will come and ordain our beloved brother in Christ, Michael Liebler, to the sacred order of deacons. And so that's a, that's a rare thing. Ordinations don't happen very much, so be here Friday uh, afternoon for that. Newcomers, if you haven't been to a newcomers class, that is next Saturday at 9 a.m. And then the weekend, uh, the 7th through the 9th of October, we're having a healing prayer event. So watch out for that. And I finally, you know, we have this petition for Duncan that his immigration process would be speedily accomplished. I have good news. There's three phases to the process, and the most important and rigorous phase is the first one, which is either thumbs up or thumbs down. Duncan has passed the first phase now. It's going to happen. Now he's got to deal with the British Foreign Office and the American Embassy, uh, and that may be expedited. So his uh, process is moving along, and it looks like he indeed will come and be with us as a clergy person. Ms. Jen? Good morning. I come to you this morning on behalf of the outreach team. Just a couple of things that we have going on um, and ways that you can be involved with those things that I wanted to make you aware of this morning. Um, the first is um, beginning today until October 16th, we are collecting socks and undergarments um, to benefit the community shelter of Union County, uh, which is a homeless shelter over in Monroe. Um, please, obviously, new items in the packaging <laughs> only. This is, this is not to get rid of your used things, but um, new items. And I understand all sizes are needed, but men's sizes are, are a particular need. So if you're going to pick something up, um, consider grabbing men's sizes. Um, but other things are welcome, women's and children's as well. Um, so that there shall be a container out in the Narthex area somewhere for you to drop those in, and it will be there until October 16th. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know about um, is that as an outreach team, um, we would like, you, uh, like to invite you to join us in prayer. Um, we meet together on the second Sunday of every month during the coffee hour to pray together um, just for the needs of our community, uh, for the ministries that the outreach team is involved in supporting that do um, good work helping those in need in our community as well. Um, but if that, and, and we would love for you to join us on those second Sunday coffee hour times, but if that's something that's not possible for you, um, we have made a prayer guide um, that should have been, I think it was in the, ran in the email newsletter last week, you can download it from there. Um, I'm, as soon as the service is done, going to actually go out and our bulletin board in the hallway, I'm going to put a few printed copies of that prayer guide out there as well that you can grab. Um, we would love for you to take that and use it in your personal prayer time, use it with your family, use it with your small group. Um, it's kind of designed to be used prayers of the people style. There's a, you know, for each little section, there's, there's a prayer topic and then a, a collect um, from that beautiful section of collects in the back um, that speak to different themes. And we would love for you to take that and to use it um, and to just join us in prayer for um, the people around us, our community, and the needs um, that are there. So that is what I have for you this morning. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God.
please turn to page 131 in the Book of Common Prayer. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. Our service continues with the Sersen Corda. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels, and with archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us, Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
For those of you who are viewing online, we offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, look down in mercy on those who, for any reason, for any infirmity of body or mind or spirit, that they can't be here to rejoice in, in your house. We pray, Lord, that you would go to them, that you would touch them with your love and mercy, that you would heal them of any affliction of body, mind, or spirit. Lord Jesus, great physician, we pray. Heal them and raise them up. Amen. Turning to page 137 for our post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food, the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses to Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. We send to the cross of Christ. We stand from the cross of Christ. All the devil's works. We stand from the cross of Christ. All our hopes. We stand from the cross of Christ. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you 
and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.